Well, welcome to the Biblical Communicator. Um, I remember years ago when I first met Dr. Haddon Robinson. I had traveled from my home all the way to Boston, myself and 35 other people from all over the world, just to sit at his feet. We enrolled in a doctoral program for the only, re the only reason we did so is that Haddon would be our mentor in training us in homiletics, in preaching. And I remember the first time he walked into the classroom. You got to know Haddon. He, he had a very gruff voice. He was from New York. And after some pleasantries, he said, oh, we're going to be together for some time. And I hope you like me. But frankly, I don't care. Because my job is to make you a better preacher. And sometimes that's going to hurt. Sometimes it's going to hurt a lot. And Haddon was truly a prophet because that program beat me up and spit me out several different times. And I'm not suggesting that this class will hurt a lot. That, that's not the idea, except to say that preaching God's word is no easy or light matter. I don't believe there's a greater privilege in this world. I don't believe, believe there's a greater responsibility. I don't believe there's anything more that our world needs right now than an accurate and relevant proclaiming of God's word. And so let me, let me pray for us just before we continue on today to say thank you, God, Lord, for giving us the resources you've given us for tapping our shoulders to be people who would proclaim your word, whether it be in pulpits or in youth groups or even one-on-one -on -one to our children. I pray, God, that we would represent it well and that even as we begin this class, would you use it to, to sharpen our abilities to proclaim your word that we might represent you properly in the name of your son. Amen. Well, preaching has fallen on some very, very hard times these days, and several different reasons, but one of the reasons is probably the, the scandal or the testimony of the preachers themselves. We know the news doesn't seem to have any problem reporting on those celebrity preachers who once proclaimed Christ but now have walked away claiming that all that they had done was a waste of time. Or preachers who would proclaim holiness and integrity and uh, commitment to selflessness on Sunday. But on Monday through Saturday, they are uh, living in perversions and pornography and substance abuse and materialism and plagiarism and bullying. Or maybe there's this health, wealth, and prosperity group driving their Bentleys while many people can't understand why God won't honor their faith. No, or I believe preaching has fallen on hard times today just because of the oversaturation of our digital age. You go to the internet and you can find anybody you want to hear preach. There are preachers galore. Plus a lot of folk you don't want to hear preach, you can hear them. You can listen to TED Talks ad nauseum. There are talking heads all over. Everywhere you turn today, there are talking heads telling us how we need to live our life. And, and they are professional communicators, so they are speaking with passion. They are using their special effects. They are telling us that if we don't do this, all these things will happen. And after a while, suddenly all of the communicators can begin to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, wah, 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 all the same. Just the oversaturation. I believe that part of the reason why the preaching has fallen on sad times these days is because of the uh, culture's opinion of the church. We've had a culture shift, of course, and so the, the church is labeled as that which is homophobic and a lot Islamophobic and uh, women oppressive and hate mongers and the Bible is nothing more than a book of hate mongering so why should we listen to what it has to say I, I think though the greatest reason why preaching has fallen on bad times is because of weak preaching pulpits all over uh, America the western world I believe the world as a whole a lot of times the preacher has an agenda 
And maybe their agenda is sincere. Maybe it is culturally driven. They want to be accepted. They want to have words that people will hear. And so the gospel is often watered down and the message is often diluted and it often becomes a bunch of psycho babble twaddle. And don't hear me wrong. If in fact there's something offensive in the way we communicate, then we need to change it. No question about it. If we can communicate more clearly with less offense, a different way, then let's do it. But there is something offensive about the message. And we don't want to defang the word of God in order to be popular with our culture. Listen, they can get all kinds of talking heads, remember, online. They don't need another one. It's the authority of the word of God that will ring into their soul. And so even though scripture, preaching of it has fallen on, on bad grounds these days, we can't, we can't abandon it. We, we just can't. I mean, look it. Paul says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? God has chosen preaching to be the tool to get his message out. Paul says this. This is his swan song, right? He's getting ready to die. He's giving his protege his last instruction. This is so critical. Especially, you can see this in Paul's way he, he, he builds up this oath, this charge. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. So this is going to be an important command here. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Um, just a, a case study. In Psalm 19, and you, we could go a lot of different places, but Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We know for the next six verses in Psalm 119, it's talking about general revelation. And Paul would echo this, that through the, the handiwork of God, through his creation, we can see his power, we can see his vastness. And it's interesting, in these first six verses, that's talking just about general revelation, you find God mentioned one time. And the time that he's mentioned is the generic word L. Very impersonal word. It's kind of like Mr. God. You can tell things about God from the, the universe, from his creation. You can tell that God is powerful, but you can't tell whether or not he's personal through his creation. You can tell that God is vast, but you can't tell whether or not he's loving. You can tell whether or not God is uh, uh, really big, but you can't tell whether or not he's really good through creation. And so there are things about him that we can tell through creation, but look at what happens when we get to verse 7. Suddenly it starts talking about God's general, uh, God's specific revelation, right? It says, the law of the Lord. Now we're talking his special revelation. The law of the Lord. And look at Lord. Now suddenly God's name is going to be used multiple times. And it doesn't use the generic word L. It uses the word Yahweh. This is God's personal name. You can know about God through creation, but you can only know God. This is critical for us. You can only, your people can only know God through his word. And look what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete. It's all we need. It revives the soul. It brings about new birth, Paul would tell Timothy. It gives a rejuvenation. Your people may have fatigued, exhausted souls, but that which is going to revive it only is the word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure. You can count on it. It's like an anchor. It makes wise the simple. Let me tell you, you've got people in your youth group, in your women's ministry, in your pews Sunday morning who need wisdom. There's all kinds of decisions coming after them. They're going to need to know how to navigate life through the word of God. They will understand. They will have the wisdom that they need to do what God has for them to do. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. I like this. 
Because sometimes we think God's word is a burden. It's a hassle. No, 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 no. It's never meant to be a hassle. It, it, it rejoices. Uh, there's a joy that can only be found in an understanding of the word of God. When we don't teach God's word the way we ought to to our people, we deprive them of them knowing the joy that can be theirs in life. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I don't know if you've ever looked into the eyes of somebody who's uh, dejected, they're despairing, uh, all hope is lost. Well, that's not the eyes of one who is immersed in the word of God. Their eyes are alive, they're dancing. Regardless, is not related to their circumstances, but to their understanding of the word of God. We could go on and on with Psalm 19 and finish off its description of the word of God. Or we could go to Psalm 119, which is in the very center of your Bible. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is longer than 31 of the books of the Bible by verse count. Psalm 119, 176 verses, I believe 172 of them, specifically refer to the word of God. The longest chapter in the Bible, the very center chapter in the Bible, talks about the riches, the power, the need we have for the word of God, the need your people have for the word of God. It's up to you and I to proclaim it, to share it. But how do you do that? That's not all that easy. Let me introduce you to a phrase called expository preaching. Expository preaching. You might go, expository, what? I mean, what is expository preaching? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that question. And there are a lot of different definitions of expository preaching, but this class will be uh, focused on expository preaching. So it's important that we know it. And this is the, the simplest definition I can find that I understand it to be. Expository preaching is a style of preaching where the passage governs the sermon. In, in other words, I don't have this great idea and then go looking for verses to try to support my great idea. And then I get up and I share my great idea and I kind of sanctify it with proof texting authority of, of the word of God. Now, listen, my opinion is great as I think it is. Bottom line is it comes from a deceived heart, a broken life, baggage filled, a very self uh, perceived centered person. My opinion, your opinion is, is irrelevant. It's God's opinion that matters. And so we go to the word with the idea of saying, I don't know what the text says here, but I'm going to study it and find out what God's message is saying. And that's what I'm going to proclaim to my, to my people. Let me ask you this. What is a successful sermon? That's, your congregation is going to be asking you of this. Your kids in your youth group or the, the uh, people that in the seniors home that you're speaking to, they're going to have their ideas. And some may think that a successful sermon is simply when the preacher gets done on time. And if he gets done early, I'll give him an A+. Plus. Or maybe if the preacher entertains me, you know, or if they move my emotions, they tell some stories that make me laugh, or they tell, they tell me some things to make me cry. Or, or maybe if they preach out of the right version, or they're always incorporating uh, current events, or, or, or they're hammering, banging on the pulpit, or they're crying themselves, or, or they are, are harping on a sin that I've been harping on for my kids for some time. You know, there's different definitions of successful sermons. But a successful sermon in God's eyes, what's that? See, that's, that's really, that's the only audience we need to worry about uh, pleasing with this. And I'm going to say this. A successful sermon explains interprets and applies the big idea of a text. Now notice, a successful sermon will do three things, right? Explain, interpret, and apply. So I'm going to preach on the uh, food sacrifice to idols. I'm going to explain to my people what that means. And then they're going to have a question. So what? What does that mean for my life? So then I'm going to interpret it for them. This is what this means for your life. Interpret it. And then I'm going to apply it. This is how the, you can live this biblical principle out this week. And so if every one of your sermons both explains and interprets and, and applies, 
uh, you're going to be doing well because a lot of people will stop on one of those and never incorporate, incorporate them all. So it's going to explain, interpret, and apply, but what? The big idea of a text. We believe that every literary unit in Scripture... Uh, every pericope, not necessarily every single verse, although sometimes that might be true, especially in the book of Proverbs, but it may also be a whole chapter, but every section of scripture, every uh, literary unit has one big idea, the one big idea that the author was trying to communicate. We call that the authorial intent. That's what we're after. And so you're going to find that big idea in the text that the author's uh, seeking to communicate and we're going to explain it and interpret it and apply it. That's what we're going to be seeking to do. Now, a lot of people, they start off with the modern world. They say, what are my uh, people dealing with these days? That's what I'm going to address. And then they go looking uh, for some verses that support and kind of underline and help them address what their people are dealing with. And as long as we're faithful to the word of God, that, that's not necessarily a bad uh, style. But that's not the way expository preaching works. Expository preaching starts with the ancient world. Before we can answer the question, what does this mean for me? Or what does this mean for my people? We have to answer, what did it mean for them? And so we take our commentaries and our word studies. And if you know the languages, you're doing grammatical analysis and you're, you're figuring it out. You're going through your theologies. What was it that Paul was trying to get across in this letter, in this chapter, in this paragraph? What was the big idea that he's going through? And once you land on that big idea, you start thinking about your modern world. Who are the people in your congregation? Do you, do you, do you know who they are? I, I know some things about the people in your congregation. For example, uh, I would suppose that you have someone like this on Sunday morning in your congregation, perhaps a teenager. Maybe he grew up in youth, your children's ministry. Uh, he's got a lot of verses memorized, did well in Awana. But the last few years, he's been questioning his faith. He's been wondering whether or not God really exists. He tends to think that the Bible is man-made and full of errors. Uh, he's been living like that. He, he went to his party last night. He's got a very bad headache right now because of it. And he can't wait till he's 18 and then he's leaving home. You probably have someone like that sitting out in your congregation. You probably also have a, a girl who was at that same party. And she's overladen with guilt. And she's been crying out to God for the last two months. Oh, please, God, if you just show yourself to me, I, I promise I'll follow you if you'll just show me that you're real. But she, her prayers have been met with silence. And she's, she can't understand why. You probably have a single mom out there who's been trying to raise three boys on her own. But she's at her end physically and emotionally. Uh, she's sapped in so many different ways. Financially, maybe a little anger towards her ex. Maybe a little anger towards God because she did nothing to deserve this. You have a, a midlife gentleman out there. He might be on your governing board. He doesn't even know it. But his faith has grown cold over the years. Perhaps his mind is beginning to be filled with uh, fantasies that certainly don't honor God. You have a, a uh, single lawyer who, smiling on the outside, but on the inside, they're thinking some very dangerous, self-destructive thoughts. I mean, do you know who your people are? Because our goal is not to give a lecture about God's word. When we get up there to preach or teach at, at, at youth group, we're not trying to fill time. We're not just going to have them go home and tell their parents on what a great job we did. That's not what we're after. We're after their souls because that's what hell is after. That's what culture's trying to get. And the only thing that's going to get there is not your wisdom or my wisdom, but God's word. And so we're going to start here. We're going to work hard to get that big idea. And then we're going to bring a bridge into their lives. This is how this word, not my opinion, but this word applies to their lives. That is expository preaching. That's big idea preaching. And that's what we're after. And that is no easy feat, let me tell you. Because getting this big idea, starting here, 
And getting this big idea, before we move on, getting this big idea is going to be the hardest part of your study. Let me close with a quote by Jowett. This is a great quote, by the way. He says, I have a conviction that no sermon is ready for preaching nor ready for writing out until we can express its theme in a short, pregnant sentence as clear as crystal. I find that the getting of that sentence is the hardest, the most exacting, and the most fruitful labor in my study. And all of those who are a part of expository preaching would say, amen, that's right. That's what will drive you most crazy when people aren't looking and no one's around and you're banging your head on your desk and on your commentaries trying to get there. But as you spend time on your knees and in the word, uh, God will, in fact, open your eyes to that. I believe so. And so let me pray for us as we continue on this week, as we embark on this journey. Because God, we would say thank you. Thank you so much for those who've been faithful in our lives in the past, who spent hours when they could have been out doing other things. They spent hours for our sake studying your word, uh, researching it out preparing for us that we might grow, that we might know you, that we might be exactly where we are today. And God, if you would use us that way, I pray that you would equip even with this class to bring that about. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.